What we're going to talk about for a couple weeks is living life with less mess. Um, we all experience messes in our life from time to time. Uh, and if you're not in one right now, uh, you're probably coming out of one. And if you're not coming out of one and you're not in one, you probably have one on the horizon. That's just part of our reality. That's the world that we live in. And in fact, we have a name for people when we see people off in the distance and you can just tell their life is disheveled, uh, we say that they look like they're a hot mess, right? And hot mess is actually a phrase that's been around a long time, but a couple hundred years ago, uh, hot mess actually was used in the military in the 19th century. You went to get your hot mess, that was your, your dinner, your lunch. It was the mess hall, the hot mess in the mess hall. In the 20th century, they used it, they evolved it a little bit more, and a hot mess was a dangerous situation. You know, this group of people have found themselves in a hot mess. And now, in the 21st century, when we say people look like they're a hot mess, what we're really saying is they look like they're uh, an attractive disaster. (laughs) They are basically someone who everything is falling apart around them, and everything is crumbling down around them, but they're still managing to hold it together. They're still somewhat functional. They look a lot better than their circumstances, but you just know they're a hot mess. And really, that's our goal in life, right? To go through all the things that we go through and just at least maintain the appearance that we're okay. Maintain the appearance that everything is fine. A couple months ago, oh, 15 minutes or so before the 8 o'clock service started, I got some interesting news that I wasn't allowed to share for several months. And I had to keep it together on the outside and not come in here and go, we're having a baby and I forgot my sermon. (laughs) So sometimes you just have to keep it together. Sometimes you have to hold things together on the outside when turmoil is going on on the inside. And that's kind of being a hot mess. And these messes come in all shapes and sizes. You might be going through a financial mess, a family mess, a, a visual mess, a professional mess. Some of you may still even be in academic or educational messes. You may have married a mess. Somebody just raised their hand on academic mess, so <laughs> grade card's coming out soon, bud. That's rough. You may have married a mess, all right? And, and, and ladies, we know how this works, right? You married a mess because you want to fix him. You can fix him. You can change him. And guys, we understand this too, because guys, you may have married a mess because... She was pretty. You know, like, we, we, we marry a mess. Some of you are parenting messes right now, and some of you were parented by messes. But you always find yourself in these messy situations. We create it, or it happens, but mess is all around us. And the good news is, maybe this is a silver lining on the cloud, there's always someone whose life is in a bigger mess than you. I don't know if that's supposed to make us feel better or worse, but there's always somebody whose life is a bigger mess than us. And really, mess is kind of what brings us together today. We are in this place, by and large, in part because we have mess. And I think it's important that we acknowledge our messes because oftentimes Christians look at other people's messes and they see folks in a mess and they don't necessarily listen to those folks or they don't learn from their folk, those folks. They criticize the mess, but they don't become students of the mess because we can look at that and we can say, well, it's not my mess. I understand I have issues just like anybody else, but my mess certainly isn't like that. But when you learn the story behind someone's mess, you, you view them differently and you, you view their messes differently. So there's always somebody in a bigger mess than you, and it's, it's not just you. It's, it's everyone. Mess is kind of the great equalizer. Mess is the same that puts us all on the same playing field because regardless of what mess you're in or regardless of what mess you're in, we're all in or the product of or headed towards some kind of attractive disaster. But we believe in this place especially that the mess that brings us together is the same mess that brought God to us. You know, for God so loved the world, for God so loved the mess. For God so loved the mess that he looked down on it and he said, I'm not going to flood it again. I'm not going to destroy it. I'm not going to burn it to the ground. 
I'm going to address their mess. I'm going to address their mess, and I'm going to do it with a word called grace. I'm going to address their mess with grace. And no one expected it, and no one considered it, and most people missed it. Because they weren't expecting grace to address their mess. We're going to read some of the writings of Paul today, and I think it's always important. We know this about Paul, but I think it's important to remind ourselves about Paul anytime we read anything from Scripture he wrote. Paul was a very educated man. He was a very learned man. He was a, he was a Jewish man. He was a scholar. And he spent most of his early life dealing with and fighting against what was essentially, in the minds of him and his people, in their minds, was a Jewish knockoff called The Way. He was fighting a group of people that were screwing up the Jewish customs, talking about stuff they had no business talking about. And he fought those people. He fought people in this weird, pseudo-Jewish religion called The Way that ultimately would be called Christianity. So I think it's important to remember that when we hear Paul talk about it. Paul was very familiar with Jewish customs. Paul was very familiar with the law. We're going to read from Romans chapter 3 today. And before I go on, who has their Bible? All right, a few more folks than last week. If you were here last week, I'm reminding you and I'm encouraging you uh, to please do your best. Bring your Bibles to church. There's stuff in here I want you to see. Uh, There's stuff in here that I want you to know where it is uh, as we we go through these, these passages together. So we'll keep reminding you of that. Thank you for bringing your Bibles. Romans chapter 3, and we're going to start on verse 19. It says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Now, that's, that's, that's just fancy wording there for you are under uh, whatever law is over you. If there is a law over you, you are under it. Now, for, for those of us here today, uh, hopefully the law that is over you is, uh, is the scriptures, is God's word. That's the law that we adhere to. But everyone, even if you don't call yourself a believer, even if you're a believer of a different faith, you are under a law. Some kind of law. It might be the law of Scripture. It might be the old Jewish law. It might be the law of a different faith. It might be just your, your moral compass. A lot of people just, you know, I'm, I'm a good person. And I follow a moral law. Uh, you might be under the law of your parents' house. Whether you're, <laughs> there you go. Uh, you might be worried about that academic mess you're in. Then. Uh, you, um, you might be under the law of your, uh, of your grandparents' house. You might be under all these different laws, but you are under a law. And only the laws that you're under apply to you. Some of you broke a law coming here today because you were running late. And there is a law that is over you on Mountain Road. And many times we fall short. Or in this case, we would have to say we exceed the law. That law being the speed limit and the various shortcuts that we take. But we are all under some kind of law. And we all, we'll find out later in these verses, we all kind of fall short of that law. Or when it comes to speed, we all go in excess of that law. We all break it, whether your law is scripture, whether your law is morality, whether your law is is just kind of the civil law is the law of the land. We all fall short of the law. And we all break the law. And our response to that is generally the same, but nobody's perfect. Thank you. Nobody's perfect. Everybody messes up. Nobody's perfect. And anytime we acknowledge that nobody's perfect, you're acknowledging that there is a perfect, that nobody is. Think about that. The rest of verse 19 goes on to say, So that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be accountable, may be held accountable to God. So within the law, whatever law you're under, within the law there's this subtle sense of accountability. Like I said, our mess, or the law, or sin, becomes a great equalizer. It evens the playing field. Because when it comes to the law, we are all silenced. Because we've all missed it. We've all failed. Nobody's perfect. So it silences everyone. Because we are all accountable to whatever law that we're under. We've all been under it. We've all been under this law. And we've all broken it. Verse 20. 
goes on to say, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So now we get this, we have accountability, and now we have this reflection. Through the law becomes the knowledge of sin. The law kind of lets us know what we've done wrong. The knowledge of sin. And Paul says here, you'll never be, you'll never be so good that God says you're good enough. That's not how the law works. You'll never be so good that God says you're good enough. And so sometimes the problem in, in, in these places, in, in, the, in the types of gathering we have, is who likes to be reminded how they messed up? Nobody wants to be reminded of their shortcomings. Nobody wants to be reminded of how they messed up. But the law gives us the knowledge of our sin, and the law tells us where we messed up. And it makes us ask ourselves the question, what does the law that you're under... Whatever law that is, maybe it's scripture, maybe it's Jewish law, maybe it's the laws of the land, maybe it's your moral law. What does the law that you're under remind you that you're not? Because the law will always show us that we're not something. My law that I am under reminds me that I am not forgiving enough, that I am not loving enough, that I am not patient enough, that there is a standard that's been set and a standard that's been given to us in example form by Jesus Christ that I don't meet. That's what the law reminds me of. And you have things in your law that remind you of where you're missing out, where you're falling short. A few, verse later, a few verses later, Paul gives us that, that famous verse, we, we know, we use it, we tell it to our kids. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Whatever standard you hold yourself to, you've fallen short of it. And every mess... Every mess in your life, every mess in anyone else's life has a reference point. And the mess, the reference point to the mess, you can always look back and, and, and find it. It might be a week ago, a month ago, years ago. You say, that was it. That was the point where I fell short. That's the point where I started this mess. That's the point where someone else fell short and kicked off this mess. Some of you right now in your children's lives are creating their reference point that they'll be referencing years later in therapy. That was the moment that things got messed up. But every mess has this reference point of there was a moment when there was a standard that didn't get upheld. That's where I fell short. That's where my parents fell short. That's where my boss fell short. That's where my training fell short. And some, someone fell short of a law. We always companion this verse with, with Romans 6.23, just a couple, hour, uh, couple chapters over, and it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus our Lord. So we mentioned this before, and I'll mention it again, and I'll mention it over and over and over. Sin always destroys something. Sin always hurts something. Sin always breaks something. Sin always kills something. Now, if you're not a Christian here today, sin will rob you of the most important thing, which is eternal life with God. But even in the life of a believer, sin hurts something. Sin breaks something. And this verse simply explains it to you. The wages of sin, the thing that you're going to get because of your sin, the thing that you will earn because of your sin, your wages, is death. It always will be. But Jesus came. To address the mess. John 3.16 is is one of the most familiar passages in scripture. And we know it and all of us know it by heart. For God so loved the world, gave his only son. Whoever believes in him would have eternal life. Eternal life. But I never like reading John 3.16 without reading John 3.17 right after it. Because John 3.17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. God didn't send Jesus to the world to identify and condemn the mess. Yep, you messed up. Yep, that's broken, and that's broken, and that's broken. Jesus came not to condemn the mess, but to address the mess. He says, yes, you've created this mess, but I can show you the way 
through it and I can show you the way out of your mess. You don't have to live in that anymore. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, John eight twelve. he says, Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. And any of these I am statements that Jesus makes, he makes seven of them in Scripture, any of these statements, you have to think, why would Jesus compare himself to these things? Jesus compared him, you know, I'm the good shepherd. Because we're, we're like sheep oftentimes. Why would he compare himself to the door? I'm the gate, I'm the door. Well, it's because we need a way. We need a way through something. We need a way into something. Why would he compare himself to the light? Jesus says, I am the light because we're in a dark place. You need the light because you're in a dark place. He goes on, that whole verse says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You do not have to walk in darkness. I'm not here just to shine the light on your mess. I'm not here to identify your mess. God's word reflects the law to us. We know we have the knowledge of sin. I'm here to show you a way out of your mess. I came so that you can have the glory of God. I came to save you. That's why I am the light. We experience darkness, we experience messes all throughout all throughout our lives and seemingly on a daily basis and on a weekly basis and even in the world that we live in. This week we were confronted with with yet another example of senseless violence, a seemingly random act so heinous we can't wrap our minds around it, another mass shooting. Another group of people that lost their life. Another group of people that lost family members. And we say, God, why? God, how long? And before the dust even settles, we start the game. We start the blame game. And we raise an angry fist in defiance and say, it was not my group that caused this, and it wasn't my mess that caused this, and it wasn't my mess that caused this. We blame people, and we blame governments, and we blame illnesses, and we blame laws, but the cause of the mess is the same cause that it's always been, and that cause is sin. Because sin always destroys something. And we have, and we've been given the knowledge of the cure for sin, because the cure for sin has always been Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, if sin always destroys, always kills, always hurts something, always breaks something, the gospel of Jesus Christ always changes something. And each and every one of us have examples in our life where the gospel has changed something. And People ask me all the time, and I've given this answer before, you know, what's your favorite part of ministry? What's your favorite part about being a pastor? And I say, you know what? I've been given a front row seat, and we've all seen this, but I've been given a front row seat to the gospel changing someone. I haven't read about it in books or seen it on movies or seen it on TV. I've actually seen the gospel of Jesus Christ get a hold of a person and change it. I've actually seen it get a hold of a family and change it and get a hold of a church and change it. And yes, even get a hold of a community And change it. And the world would call it being naive, but I call it being hopeful. That I believe not only can the gospel change a a person and a church and a community, but I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ can change the country and the world that we live in. It's the simplest, most basic truth. The same way we share it to our children, we share it with adults that there was a mess. There's always been a mess. And Jesus came to address that mess. And he came and he lived a perfect life and he he died for our sins and then he defeated the mess and he rose again from the grave. And then he left us with something. When Jesus ended his earthly ministry and went back to heaven, he left us with two great things. One of which being the great commandment. The greatest commandment. Love God, love people. The other great thing was the Great Commission. 
which is simply tell everybody. And so when we look out in the world and we look for solutions and we look for social solutions and, and we look for government solutions and we look for political solutions, you can champion your cause and you can shake your angry fist in defiance, but if your solution for the mess is not wrapped up and mitigated by the gospel of Jesus Christ and those two great things, then your solution will always leave you and always leave us in a mess. Every political solution, every economic solution, every social solution has to be held in conversation with those two great things. Love God, love people, tell everybody. Because we've been given grace. Sin is the great equalizer. Jesus fixes the mess. So if you've looked for solutions outside of those two great things, if you've looked for solutions outside of the gospel, I would encourage you to seek other solutions. Because we look around and we, we, we see the, the mess and we see the darkness and we say this world needs a light. This world needs a solution to the mess. And Jesus says, that's, that's why I came. I came to address this mess. Not to show it to you, not to point it out to you, not to tell you how your mess is better than this person's mess, but it's not as bad as this person's mess. But so that you wouldn't have to be in your mess. And so that you could take that knowledge, you could take that love, and you could go beyond this place, and so that there would be less messes. The solutions don't come more laws or less laws or, or more government or less government or, or this and that. The solution comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ and how we choose to share it and what we choose to do with it. So what does the law that you're under show you that you're not? 